Welcome to Red, White and Blue. I'm Gary Pollan from the right. And I'm David Jones and I'm sitting to the left and am on the left of Gary Pollan. This week we're going to be talking about mobility, something that everyone who lives in our community deals with every day. And with, it, with this topic, David, we have three interesting guests. First, John Long, Executive Director of Bike Houston. Secondly, Karen Potman, who's the Chairman of Metro, also a fine lawyer and someone you and I have both known for too long. And she's a <laughs> she, fine lady. And finally, Bill Brudnick, who has awesome responsibilities as the Director of Transportation and Planning and Development for TxDOT. And if you wonder why our freeways are congested everywhere all at once, we're going to get the answer from Bill today. Welcome to all of you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and uh, John, I got to tell you, I don't see how or why anyone should ride a bike in Houston unless you have not seen the roads. Everywhere I go, there's cars parked on either side. There's really only room for one car to pass, and yet two are trying to do so. Now, what is a biker supposed to do in that traffic? And that's all over inner city Houston that I could see in residential areas. So it's dangerous. What's the point? Well, I, I, I hear that characterization uh, whenever anyone wants to get a rise out of a bike rider. I rode from our office in Montrose here today on my bike wearing these clothes. Uh, and it was, uh, I got here faster than I would have in a car. Um, I, I felt safe the entire way. Uh, there weren't uh, particular bike lanes, although uh, part of my route was identified as a, as a bike route. Um, and uh, th when I got here, however, I will point out that the studio does not have parking for bikes. So I, I locked my bike up to the, uh, the, the historical sign outside the studio that identifies the history of Channel 8. Ah, well, I think it's safe. I think it's safe. All right, well, that answers your question. So let me move to, the, to a, <laughs> a bigger topic. Bill, uh, TxDOT has awesome responsibility. The, the taxpayers of Texas voted to go along with the legislature and divert $2.5 I believe, every biennium of additional funds from sales tax revenue to fund our road program. And any objective measure, our roads are as bad or worse than they have been in the last decade. It is breathtakingly bad. So how did this happen? All over the state? Well, I'm talking about our region, our, where our viewers are, which is in southeast Texas. Okay. It's terrible. It is terrible. Right. Well, I can tell you, um, you know, we work with our um, Houston Galveston Area Council, and uh, with that, we, they prioritize our, our funds and, and our projects. Uh, recently, Prop 1 and Prop 7 did pass, and what it did, it brought additional funding to our region. So with that, we're going to uh, use those funds, and uh, we that with that money, we just re created a st the largest UTP, the Unified Transportation Plan that we have in place, and uh, that was over seventy billion dollars statewide. Uh, this region received uh, a good uh, amount of that money. I think. 12 to 13 billion dollars and we're going to work with our um, Houston area council and we're going to put this money on the most needed and congested uh, projects to go ahead and relieve this congestion. Okay. So, but, you, but you drive in this traffic uh, every day too just like er, well you ride in this traffic and I believe Bill <laughs> or John rather when he tells us he got here quicker on a bike because I took pictures I don't know whether the producers are going to use them or not but I took pictures of my experience this week on 288 going to the courthouse. Used to be I could go from Bel Air to the courthouse in 20 minutes on an average day unless there was an accident. And now it's a parking lot mm. every single day. I'm now going overland because it's quicker, which is quite astounding. And I'm not the only one experiencing that. There are lawyers in the courthouse who are close to retirement age who are now quitting because they just got too tired of all the traffic they got to deal with because it, it gets worse and worse. So. My question is, is there any answer to this? Or, mm -hmm. or maybe we should switch I was over gonna say, to Karen because she may have the answers she, and it may she, be she, less she, automobiles. She has, some interest, be next. she has some interest in bus activity. But we're going to let him have a shot first and then we'll let Karen have at it. <laughs> well, we're um, on the congestion side of things, we're, we're going to continue to keep on partnering. Uh, it's not a one. Um, we need to be multimodal, and uh, that includes not only you know cars and trucks, but we need to go ahead, uh, provide, work with our partners, provide for transit, um, you know, bike, uh, bike as well as pedestrian elements, and um, you know that that's going to be the way that we move forward, and it's going to be a partnership. Okay, so back to Corin, who yes. she's only been on for two years, so she's only experienced two massive floods, so that you know she's probably been swamped. 
you know, oh, is my very guess. Good. I mean, that was a pun. <laughs> yes, but, but, but I think it was meant to here's, be. Here's what, here's what you as and other Metro chairmen and chairwomen have. Are you the first? I am the first. Oh. Yes, Mayor Turner broke that barrier. Yeah, he's a barrier breaker. He sure is. Um, the city voters have until recently resisted various rail systems. Kathy Whitmire, monorail, shot down. Bob Lanier, no, we don't need it. Uh, so, in a sense, we're sort of 20 years behind coming up with a, a rail system. And so now we have something, and I would like to know how successful you think it has been, uh, what's the ridership like, and what is the cost per rider like? Well, we're, we're doing very well on our rail. Let me just say one thing, though, David. While it is true that support for rail from the mayors has been erratic, in 2003, the voters passed a referendum that did call for extensive rail throughout the area. And we're actually embarked right now on a reassessment of that plan to see which parts of it still make sense, which are obsolete in light of some new technologies, including souped up HOV lanes with possibly autonomous connected buses. But there is a robust plan out there that was voted by the voters and passed in 2003. And it passed at the time that the red line was being built. So the red line has since been expanded north we built the green line out east and the purple line southwest. Our red line is one of the very most successful lines in the country in terms of ridership per mile. And our green lines and purple lines are coming on. They've just only been in operation, gosh, I best guess a year, um, in one case a year and a half. And so our ridership is slowly building and we feel pretty good about where we are there. Of course, the university line was going to connect downtown to the Galleria and that has not been built. Is that the one yet. that Culberson opposes? Yes, Congressman Culberson uh, vehemently opposes that. Still? Yes, he does. And you can't overcome that? Well, we're in a difficult situation because you know, earmarks aren't allowed anymore, mm. but Congressman Culberson puts in a reverse earmark, is what I would call it, in the appropriations every year, forbidding money being spent on that line in that corridor. Yeah, so, we, need, we need to go back to the days of Jim Wright and Wright Patman well, when we can get things taken care <laughs> of. Well, you, can, you can bring Congressman Culberson on the show, David, and you can ask him about it. But so, so, so we were talking about the mobility, congestion problems, the same that we all experience except for John, who rides his bike. Uh, you've experienced it too. You ride, drive your car to work. You're a practicing attorney. You're just not a full-time Metro volunteer. Uh, well, what actually, you, I am. Well, I've no, retired. Oh, you did? Oh, yes, okay. I did You're retire from my retire. law firm. You're too young to Well, retire. thank you for saying that. You actually know better than that, but I appreciate <laughs> your saying that on the air. But um, <laughs> I actually did retire, and it's been my real joy to have this as pretty much you. a full-time so, job. You still, you still drive in our, tra in our traffic. What, what are we going to do? Well, the city is going to come into a total gridlock is what's coming. I, I agree with you. Absent more robust transit. And that does tie in with our major initiative, which is the redoing of our regional transit plan. And we're cooperating with TxDOT, Bike Houston, all the various constituencies. To, and then we're going to go back to the voters and ask for some more authority to issue debt to expand our system. We have to do it because the population of our Houston region is exploding exponentially. In fact, by 2045, the populations of Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, Corpus, and Arlington will be overlaid on our region. So as good a job as TxDOT does, and they do, and we do work together, we cannot possibly build enough roadways to handle that. And so to be competitive and prepare for the future, to future-proof our region, we simply must have more transit. John, it sounds like there's a perfect opportunity for bikes now. You know, and I didn't mean to be discrediting sure. Your, sure. Your, your interest in bikes and whatnot, but you can tell us whether or not there's any enthusiasm for bikes as, you know, now versus five years yeah. before yeah. now. Um, well, so, so a number of things. Just to segue with what Karen was talking about, Metro often says that the uh, uh, a bus ride or a ride on the light rail begins with a pedestrian or a cyclist. And the metro buses, you probably have seen on the front of the buses, they've got a rack to, that, that fits two bikes. 
And uh, the, ever since that was implemented, and I don't remember how many years that's been now, four or five years since mm -hmm. that's been put in place, every single year, the number of people who uh, 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 load their bikes on the front of the bus in order to begin, begin, or begin their, their bus ride has been on the increase. Uh, and I, I, I think the number last year was something like 700,000 uh, 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 rides by bike riders on metro buses. Uh, I guess huh. my, my question about bikes is, to, in, for, in order for bikes to have a major impact in, in dealing sure. with our mobility issues, and because Karen articulated her vision of what she needs to do, what do we need to be do for what do we need to do for bikes to make it? Well, a year ago, a the city factor. of Houston adopted the Houston Bike Plan. It's the first time in 24 years that there's been a comprehensive design plan in place uh, to accommodate on street as well as on-street bikeways, as well as off-street trails. Now, Houston Parks Board's been doing a tremendous job under the umbrella of Bayou Greenways 2020 of building trails along the bayous in the city. Those, I think uh, most people see those as primarily recreational, but the reality is that a lot of uh, commuters use those trails along the bayous as part of their commute. I do in the morning when I ride from, from um, my house uh, near Memorial Park to our offices in Montrose. Part of my commute is, is on the bayou trail along Buffalo Bayou. And with, by the end of 2020, there will be 150 miles of multi-use trails along the bayous within the city of Houston. That, that, that's astonishing. That, that forms a part of uh, a robust network of bikeways within the city. And the Houston Bike Plan uh, 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 complements that with uh, bike facilities. Some of them are shared bikeways. Others are protected bike lanes on the streets of the city that will will uh, promote uh, cycling within the city. C certainly, if you look around the world, there are there are cities where uh, 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 biking makes a significant impact on the the commute mode share. For Houston, if we get to the the place where it's five percent of the people who are uh, uh, commuting by bike, which exists today in the medical center, five percent of the workers in the medical center. Uh, 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 say that they ride their bike at least some of the time to get into work. Um, and uh, once you be, get, get to those kinds of numbers, even though it's uh, uh, small compared to 100 percent, it makes an impact. It does make an impact. Uh, this, well, and bear in mind that not everybody can afford a car. I mean, a, a large number of people that ride bikes to work that's their mode of transportation. So right. you just can't cut out a whole economic strata of people. Well, and to give to to give some data on that, uh, Houston is consistent with nationwide. Fifty percent of the people who commute to to work on their bikes earn less than twenty five thousand dollars a year. These are folks who biking is the most efficient way that they've got to get back and forth to work. And if we don't accommodate the needs of those folks, it's an it's a economic equity issue. Mr. Brudnick, other, other than being terrified of being on a bicycle in Houston, the other thing that scares me, and I'm actually moved to get off of freeways and accomplish that, and the one that scared me the most is 290. And I'm just wondering, is that anywhere near close to being... <laughs> Um, really U.S. 290, the reconstruction um, from 610 out to Waller County line, right now the schedule is uh, we're anticipating that to be substantially complete by the um, end of this, this year. So uh, when I say substantially complete, we'll have all U.S. 290 traffic in its final configuration. Um, with that being said, uh, we, sh we should be finished. Uh, the contract will have some miscellaneous things to wrap up, but by the end of the year, we're expecting that the lanes will be in their final configuration and open. And along, along the lines of David's question, Bill, I have a couple of subsets. The first question is, if we put more money toward uh, mobility, is it going to make any difference? Um, so there's some, some people, uh, David's friends uh, and others who <laughs> believe friends. that we are undertaxed with our gas tax. Mm -hmm. Gas tax is not representative of what should be. Had been adjusted for inflation for 25 years or something. And you and approve of increasing the, a the gas that's tax? A, that's, a, that's a compelling argument. So don't argument. say only my friends. I understand. You're giving me a hard time. No, uh, okay. it, it'll definitely make a difference. We have uh, projects now. We got priority projects. Uh, and um, 
that, that are needed and uh, we're, we're lucky that the Prop 1 and the Prop 7 passed so we're, we're finally able to go ahead and implement a lot of those projects. And, there's more uh, on the books you can't fund at this point. There are. So yeah. so I guess then, I guess the fair thing to have said from a political standpoint, because that's a decision the legislature makes, is they should vote out uh, some kind of gas tax adjustment and let the voters vote on it, right? You want more, you know, because basically there is a cost in terms of not having sufficient mm -hmm. roads, not sufficient bike trails, not sufficient mass transit in terms of people's mobility. And the cost you pay is sitting in your car, sitting in a bus waiting there, uh, not having a bike trail or getting run over on your bike. Whatever that happens, you have to pay that cost because we're not paying the other cost. So it's mm -hmm. not like free, is it? Uh, no, no, sir. And uh, with the Prop 1 and the Prop 7, we were, were, were thankful that that passed, but we do have a lot of priority projects that we need to go ahead and move and get funded. Listen, I have a project that I've heard about that I read about. Uh, no, you'll like this. It's, uh, That's your street? There, you there, want your street repaved? There's various states uh, are calling for specific flood control projects, including one called a flood-proof freeway. Can you explain mm -hmm. what that is? <laughs> well, um, First of all, you know, an um, elevated one. <laughs> I guess it would be an elevated one, but uh, right now, you know, here in you know our region, uh, you know, our our goal is to move people and goods, and anytime you know one of these facilities get flooded, man, there's major impacts. And uh, what we do is we design our facilities based on historical data, um, both on the elevation wise of the roadway and the drainage systems. So. Um, um, Again, you know, Harvey uh, was was a different animal. Uh, with that, the um, that was I wouldn't say it was a one-time event, but it was definitely an extreme event. And what we're doing is we're taking the the data right now. We're we're doing studies and we're we're seeing where we can improve and make uh, changes in in these roadways. Um, so. Well, That's true, where we're at. Isn't it true that our, high, our highway system, at least parts of it, are, are part of the drainage system? That is, 59 where it's below ground, going into downtown from Shepherd, going east. That's all part of the flood control plan. That's why the water builds up there. That's a place for it to go. And I guess because we live in a flat area, that, that probably makes sense. Uh, one final question for you on this topic. Why is it on major thoroughfares? where we have unbelievable congestion, we have, we have road crews working eight hours a day and not 24 hours, seven days a week. And, and as the example of that is when we redid the Pierce Elevated a few years ago, you may have been in charge then too, mm -hmm. they worked 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, and they had big bonuses for finishing early. And that project, I think, was finished a month or two early. Mm -hmm. And all the other projects, it's like they kind of move along. In nobody, nice wants work, nobody wants to work that hard. Well, they, no, they're jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, our goal is to finish all roadways and uh, minimize the inconvenience to the, the traveling public. And yes, uh, we're we continuously working with our contractors trying to get these projects accelerated, whether it be a freeway job or, um, you know, a smaller FM roadway. Um, so that's, um, you know, we, we do work usually on, on the major freeways. We will work a 24-7 uh, day job with incentives on there, and uh, it it based on the traffic in the in the demand. And uh, we want to go ahead and get all roads finished up, but uh, the incentives are usually put on the higher uh, ADT roadways. All right, so Karen, for, mm -hmm. from 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 the, your budget and what you do for Metro. What do you all need to, to become more you know, impactful and effective as an agency? Well, we need a huge amount of money. We have enough money now, we have a billion dollar budget to sustain our current operations and we have a robust transit system. You know, we take it on the chin in these national news articles, but actually we have a very successful local bus system, an excellent rail system, a, a fantastic park and ride system, one of the best in the country. But we, and we also serve our disabled community well, but in order to expand the system to meet the growing population, we really, really need to build out. Not only do we need some rail connecting to Hobby Airport, but we also need what's known as bus rapid transit. Bus rapid transit uses buses that mimic rail cars. They're very nice. The doors open flush with the platform like a rail car would. 
so ingress and egress is much easier. They have amenities, um, and they bus rapid transit is a very good alternative these days because rail is expensive. You don't want to build a lot of rail where it doesn't make sense, although there are places in Houston that additional light rail does make sense. But we also want to work in bus rapid transit and some corridors, and then of course, Metro now operates over 100 miles of high occupancy vehicle lanes, which during off-peak hours turn into toll lanes. And we now we don't operate the Katy Freeway, that's the county, but <laughs> the other ones, I want to make that clear, but we do operate the other ones, and there is a lot of opportunity for carrying suburban commuters in those HOV lanes through, as I mentioned earlier, as autonomous vehicles come online that, can, that are safer and faster in terms of, you can have these buses that look like future space age sort of capsules that are electronically connected and barrel down the max lanes at like 80 to 90 miles per hour. That's a, that's a real opportunity as well. And Karin, you know, as well as anyone, um, that one of the problems facing Houston and its mobility problems is our growth patterns yes. and the lack of regulations as mm -hmm. to where we can build and, mm -hmm. and how we get money to build in certain areas, uh, including in floodplains and the, and, the, and the like. And as an indicator of how difficult that problem is, we had this vote on city council recently, nine to seven, where they attempted to raise the level of, of new construction housing, and it was very, very close. And who, this was in Chris Tomlinson's article in the Chronicle, who was there for that vote? Uh, real estate developers, builders, every lobbyist in town, you know, trying to hold on to what has made them rich and, and made Houston a very poorly developed city. So well, uh, that, that's a burden you're carrying. Well, uh, you know, and, and let me just say, at Metro, we work with all aspects of the community. Um, I've known you so long, David. We've been Democrats, fervent Democrats for so long. But the truth of the mat matter is that in my Metro role, I do work with all sides of the aisle. And I will say that developers, as well as folks on the not that all, <laughs> there are some developers that are Democrats, but, but people of all industries and careers and professions uh, and all people really need to work together to build a robust transit system or expand one. And that's what we're trying to do. We hope to meet the needs of everyone because some of the folks that you're talking about in terms of businesses also helps provide a lot of jobs and they need Metro to carry uh, their workers to jobs, and we want to, to, to provide a very good experience well, or, for those folks. It's fair to say, if you look at in light of what you said, David, the same developers lobbying, they also were not happy when Metro built out the rail, but now we find that they built apartment luxury apartment projects all on, on the railroads. Yeah, exactly. Or you townhouses know, and the like, so they're taking advantage of that, and that's one of the amenities they now offer well, their of tenants. Well, of course, and I think there has been an expanded awareness of the benefits of high capacity transit, transit that carries a lot of people like rail or souped up bus service. Um, because if you look at the red line, you'd asked about the success of that, Gary. Eight billion dollars worth of development has grown up That's around the red line. Uh, Bill, are we going to have a high-speed rail from Houston to Dallas? And uh, what's that fight about? Is it is it city interest versus rural, or is it just you know? Uh, land disputes over uh, right-of-way and things like that? Well, at, at my level, you know, we've been briefed on the high-speed rail. Um, you know, we've had high-level discussions about it, but at my level, I, I haven't heard that uh, that detailed discussion, so really I couldn't comment on that mm -hmm. either way. So They're talking about changing development patterns, mm -hmm. it would. Yeah. You could, you could commute from, you know, rural Texas. It would be interesting. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have something I wanted to ask the three of you. If you had one wish to be granted in the area of your of your position, what would it be? So, Bill, you get to go first. You had one wish. What would you want? Um, additional funds to address a lot of our congestion needs. Karen? Additional funds. <laughs> okay, and John? <laughs> John, if you say additional funds, we're, I'm sorry, you're going to have to be... Well, uh, that, would, that would help. That would help. Um, we need the political will to 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 do to 
to build bike lanes and on-street uh, bike infrastructure in the city. To make it easier for people to do that. Exactly. Well. Thank you all three for being here, John, Karen, <laughs> and Bill. Thank appreciate you. Your, thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back on Red, White, and Blue uh, next week.